All right, sweet. The Vivi video is done. Uh, what should I do now? I could talk about a race or make a fate video. Maybe finally talk about Railgun, Boku no Pico, Monogatari. Oh, wait, I should probably do a Higurashi video. I don't think it's been too long, but I still need to make the... Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. I know that a lot of you guys have been waiting for this Sato Kawashi video. I didn't want to burn myself out on the series since I was making a lot of content around it at the time. And I also finally wanted to give Umineko a good proper read. Now that I've gotten a fair way through Umineko and I've had time to rest up, maybe a little too much, I'm here to deliver my final thoughts on Higurashi Go. I've had about two months to read, theorize, and to think about a lot of things regarding the series. And I believe I've come to some really good conclusions. Today we'll be talking about everything that happened in Sato Kawashi Hen. For your patience, this video will be the first to three. For the next two Sundays, I will be giving you guys exclusively Higurashi content, with the last video being on the third Sunday of June, the day of the Cotton Drifting Festival. Very fitting, right? Today's video will discuss Satsukawashi Hen and my thoughts on it, with the next video being on revisiting the last arcs of Go, as well as some predictions for Sotsu. And the last video on the Cotton Drifting Festival day will be connections between Umineko and Higurashi, if there are any. It's because of those videos that in this one, there will be very minimal mention of Umineko. I've been made aware that a lot of people that watch these videos on my channel actually haven't read or seen it, and they don't want to get spoiled on anything. The connections video will definitely have spoilers in it, so so I'm just going to do that separately. This way people will be able to experience Umineko for themselves, or if they do want to go in for spoilers, then they'll be able to do so on a spoiler-filled video. <laughs> you guys would know all the stuff that I just said if you looked at the community tab. This is a hint to go and look at the community tab. I do updates all the time over there. I probably post a little too much. Before getting into this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my man Beans for going over my script and keeping me in check. You've been a massive help, man. Now, Ryu decided to throw us for a loop. Neko Tomashi had naturally left us at a gigantic cliffhanger, Satsuko revealing that she was another looper and pulling a gun out on Rika. Instead of getting a direct follow-up for that, we're thrown right into the ending of Higurashi Kai as Takano is being captured. This is a big reveal as we finally know we're going to get answers for why Go is taking place, since the ending for Kai had everybody seemingly happy and with things all working out. That makes Satsuko Washi the first answer arc of Go. I was talking with a friend of mine, Bastard, really cool guy despite what his name might seem like, you should check him out, and he pointed out that there is a very key difference between the arc that is Kai's ending, Matsuri Bashihen, and the arc before it which was Minagora Hoshihen. This difference is that Minagora Hoshihen followed Satoka being abused by her uncle, and the entire village attempting to save her. This led to her realizing she could depend on her friends as she cried out for help to escape her abuse. In Matsuri Bashi, this never happens as Tepe isn't present in this arc at all, which means that Satoka in this timeline and the Go timeline as a whole never learned to go to her friends for help. This fact is extremely important for this arc, and honestly for this series as an entirety. The title for this arc actually stood out to me quite a bit, since Satoko's name was directly in the title. What I found out that some of you may already know is that Satoko Washi has a double meaning to it. The first meaning is having the name split into Sato and Kawashi. Sato in Japanese means hometown, and Kawashi means to break. This is where the primary used village destroying arc comes from, since it's direct translation comes out to hometown break. The second meaning could be referring to Satoko and Kawashi, breaking Satoko, which for those that have seen this arc know that this is exactly what happens. Anyways, just as it happened in Kai, Takano and Tomitake leave together and our group celebrates their victory. This is actually one of the last times we see Hanyu in Go, since due to her appearing before everybody, she used up a good portion of her remaining power. She is now asleep for the time being. We also see Satoko holding Rika's hand and saying that they will always be together as they look happily into each other's eyes. This, sadly, is one of the only times we see the group all together and happy without any underlying tension. The episode flashes forward a year, and we see Satoko and Rika a tad more grown up than before. The class representative is now Keichi, as Mion has graduated to go to high school in Okonomiya. The entire group seems down when they think about her, and this is the first nod to separation between the group. I mentioned in my last video that Satoko's motives seem to be desperately clinging to Rika, which would make sense if Rika was all that she had left. Mion leaving helps to support this. We then get even more confirmation that this might be happening as Rika leaves the game club early, claiming that she has to go practice for the Cotton Drifting Festival dance. But we find out immediately afterwards that Rika lied to everybody, just pretty blatantly. <laughs> she never had to practice, she instead left to focus on her own goals. There have been many instances in the past where Rika hasn't been the most truthful, and even a little bit deceitful to get what she desires. It seems that even after the game has finished and everything is resolved, she still has occasions where she doesn't tell the truth. Which, you know, I mean... It's fine and all, but I don't think it's cool to personally lie to people that quite literally saved your life. Then Satoko and Rika talk about how Keichi's game is too wholesome. 
and that they both enjoy playing dirty. This sounds like another pair of individuals I know very well now. Satoko notes how a lot has changed in Hinamizawa in the last year, and it's kind of sad to see that happen. Matsuri Bashi made it seem like everything was going to be all happy around town and things were all going to be fine, but clearly that isn't the case. Despite all of the changes in the town, her and Rika then hold hands as they continue to walk home together, seeming a bit hopeful. Satoko goes in for a checkup with Iri about her levels of Hinamizawa syndrome, and it turns out that she is entirely cured now. This is huge. I mean, Satoko had been taking shots for this for a very long time to keep her levels of the disease at bay, and Iri himself noted in the past that people could not be cured of the disease once they had reached a certain level. Iri notes that everyone's symptoms have gone down in the entire town, and it seems that the root cause of the syndrome has changed. Once he leaves, Rika notes that a certain someone decided to open up to the people of the village after 100 years. Rika is of course referring to Hanyu here, and to understand what she means here, we need to take a look at Hanyu's backstory known as Kotohogushihen. Hanyu was originally the demon goddess of Onigafuchi, which is the original name of Hinamizawa. Her and her clan were discriminated against due to them having horns. But Furude Riku, the heir to the Furude shrine at the time of this story, fell deeply in love with her. Her original name was actually Hai Ryun, but Riku thought she said Hanyu, so he called her Hanyu because of that. The two had a daughter named Oka, and this would create the long-running clan of the Furude. However, the village would be attacked by demons, and one of them would possess Riku's body. She ended up having to kill her husband with the Onigair no Ruo. I definitely butchered that, but this is the, the looper sword that is present in the show. She does this in an effort to make sure that the demons never returned to the town. Despite her doing this to protect the village, the village saw this as her murdering the shrine priest and several other people. Because of this they hunt her down, but due to her fight with the demons, she could hardly hold a materialized state, and was mostly a ghost after this. She would only be able to appear in front of her daughters. Sound familiar? A disease appears, suddenly running rampant through the village and local areas, which I would say is probably Hinamizawa syndrome, and Hanyu makes medicine to heal her daughters and her village. However, people try to steal the medicine for political gain, and this leads their own village to attack her daughter Oka and attempt to get the recipe. With her daughter being attacked and the village once again betraying her, Hanyu goes into a rampage and she murders a ton of people. Her daughter Oka knows that she's become corrupted with demon blood, and stabs her with the looper sword. This brings Hanyu back to her senses, but Hanyu begs Oka to kill her with the sword since she knows she will one day become evil again. Oka couldn't bring herself to kill her own mother, and this led Hanyu to live in the shadows for centuries. Oka was celebrated for saving the town from the demon Hanyu, and this started the legend of Oyashiro Sama's curse. Oyashira Sama referring to Hanyu. With all this history of the village betraying her, it makes a lot of sense that she would be really reluctant to come to the forefront and to help them again. It's thanks to our gang of misfits that Hanyu was able to reveal herself and that they were able to beat the game. This also includes ridding the village of Hinamizawa Syndrome, as Hinamizawa Syndrome seems to have existed solely as part of this game that they were in. Later, the Cotton Drifting Festival arrives, and the three heads of the village deliver the news that the curse is no more. This is likely due to what I mentioned earlier, since in Minagoroshihen they ignore the curse to help the Hojos for the first time in a few years. Since this takes place post Matsuri Bashihen, the idea of the curse is still likely very real to all of them since there was nothing to ever dispel or make the Hojos innocent. We see that Rena has a Blake face, but oddly enough we don't even see what Satoko's face looks like. This revelation from Rika should be massively affect the two of them since they both directly felt the effects of the so-called curse. Rena broke windows and went kinda loopy when she left the town, and Satoko lost her entire family because of it. After being told her whole family dying or disappearing was due to the curse, and being treated differently from the village because of it, who knows how hearing that there is no curse would affect Satoko. A day passes, and Rika introduces Satoko to her plan of wanting the pair to go to St. Lucia Academy. This is a school that some recognize as the one Shion attended, and others may recognize as the school that Anji Ushiromiya from Umineko attended around 1998. This, to me, made perfect sense. I mean, Rika had been trapped in Hinamizawa for a hundred years. I do not blame her at all for wanting to leave the town and experience new things in life. For the first time ever, Rika can experience tomorrow without knowing what will happen. With Iria paying for their educational expenses, Rika begins studying extremely hard to get into the academy. Satoko continually thinks Rika will give up, but after seeing how hard she pursues her dream, Satoko starts studying too. We then get an incredibly cute montage of both Satoko and Rika working together to get into the school which has an insert song sung by the two's voice actresses. Really cool touch, by the way. I love it when we have the cast singing songs in anime. 
We get to see the two growing older, and there are more hints sprinkled in this montage that Satoko may be genuinely in love with Rika. It's all just so bittersweet, but as Higurashi fans know, something like this won't last forever. The time is now March 1st in 1987, the year that an animatronic bit someone in a certain horror game, and four years after the events of the original series. This means that Rika still has one year left before she was brought back to Hinamizawa. The two roll up to St. Lucia, which on the surface seems like a very nice place. Rika makes it in, and Satoka goes over to see if she made it in. She says she worked her ass off because she couldn't bear the thought of being away from Rika, which is a little concerning, and then she finds out that she too made it in. This is, uh... This is where things start to go downhill. Rika and Sajiko are put in different dorms, and they hardly get the chance to interact outside of class. Which, by the way, when you watch these scenes, it's really fun to play guess the main character. The only characters that are relevant here have different hair colors, or they have different hairstyles. Like in this entire school, Rika and Satoko are the only ones with different hair colors. Everyone else has the same few colors in their hair. Classic anime. Rika goes to hang out with other girls, and she does offer Satoko an invite, but Satoko declines the invitation, thinking that Rika's parlor time will just be a phase. Yikes, I don't like where this is going. This is also where we see that Rika ends up having a knack for tea in a parlor that is known for its debates, which probably isn't a coincidence. Because of the lack of Rika's presence in her life, Satoko can't focus in class and her grades are failing. She ends up having to go to study hall to help pick up her grades. Rika offers to help, but due to a wall of rich girls surrounding her, Satoko feels too isolated to let Rika help her. With this isolation from her classmates due to her behavior and attitude, as well as her grades, this leads to a complete separation between Satoko and Rika. We see how big of an impact Minagoro she had had on Satoko as a character, since if this were that fragment of Satoko, she would reach out for Rika's help, but she can't build the courage to do so in Satoko Washi because she never had to rely on her friends as hard as she did in that fragment. Due to her loneliness, Satoko stalks Rika on a few occasions, and expresses her anger verbally on how Rika promised she wanted to spend her life with Satoko. The two have a confrontation with one another, and it results in Satoko storming off with Rika seemingly not caring. However, after she leaves, Rika tries to defend Satoko by saying that she saved her life hundreds of times with traps. This is really silly to me, you have a lot of problems on the surface that you know you should address with the person, but yet you still do it once the person leaves. And because she didn't do this in front of Satoko, this leads her to further believe Rika does not like her anymore. It's because of this that Satoko goes into the main hall and sets up a trap for the next day as an attempt to bring back the Rika she knows and loves. In the midst of the whole school worshipping Rika, and I'm not kidding, they do worship Rika like she's a goddess, a bunch of pots fall from the chandelier. This in Hinamizawa would just be like a little small gag. But here at St. Lucia, it's a terrible, horrible, atrocious act. Especially since it actually injures somebody. Rika knows that Satoko did this, but tries to cover for her anyways. However, since she mentioned traps to her friends yesterday, they put the pieces together and figure out that Satoko was the one behind this. Satoko is then put in an orange uniform and literally put in a prison cell. Yeah, that's right. St. Lucia has a fucking prison. This academy doesn't play around. Instead of reflecting on her actions at school like she was told to do, she instead reflects all the way to the past and regrets ever telling Rika she would go to St. Lucia. In her fit, she begs and pleads for her to go back into the past and fix where it all went wrong. Careful for what you wish for, Satoko. This moment is actually ridiculously important, and I will be going into full depth on why the camera and direction focuses so hard on the outside while Satsuko wishes for this and the Umi Neko video. I can't believe this went over my head the first time when I watched this. Anyway, Satoko is locked in there for a few weeks while Rika gets to live it up on the surface. You go, girl. It's seriously great directing how they do such a hard juxtaposition between the two's current lifestyles. A year has passed, making it now 1988, five years after the events of the first series, and making it the year that Rika will get brought back to the past. Satoko gets put into the special course to catch up with her failing grades, and life seems extremely bland. That is, until Satoko gets a letter from Mion from a game club reunion. Satsuko and Rika both get time off to visit Hinamizawa, and Mion rolls up in a van dressed like an absolute mom. My Discord and the stream chat were making a lot of concerning MILF jokes about Mion, a, a lot of them. Are you guys okay? She also is a little bit of a terrible driver in my opinion, but 
I can't really talk, because I'm probably not the best either. She rolls them back into town where Sadako is happy to be back, and where Rika suddenly adopts her old speech patterns again. To me, this seems like Rika is putting on a facade for those around her and Satsuko seems to also quickly pick up on it as well. This is a part of the whole thing that Rika does where she's a bit deceitful. Also, I'd just like to quickly say, I love the sense of fashion in this part of the show. It matches up perfectly with the times, and everyone's current outfits fit them extremely well. Keiichi looks like such a chad. Chad she, I love you Keiichi, you're so awesome. Rena looks absolutely adorable. Oh my gosh, Rena is the cutest thing in the entire world and nobody can tell me otherwise. But I do find it interesting that out of the entire cast, the only person that's changed their hairstyle somewhat is Satoko. I find this a little ironic since the only person that's changed their hair is the only person that's undergoing an important change in their life. It's also an interesting contrast to see Rena slamming Keiichi and Satoko into the pavement and it being received as a joke, while the pan prank at St. Lucia was seen as a crime to humanity. The gang then all play cards, the one that they originally used in the first series with all of the marked ones. We also get to see Rico wearing cat ears, Typical. Mion's really tested me with this teasing dude, like, come on, Mion. And us getting robbed of not seeing Keiichi in a swimsuit? Passion, really? You're just robbing us. I'm not gay. I'm not gay for Keiichi. I just want to make that clear. Stay away from me, comment section. I'm watching out for you. After their games wrap up, Rena hits us with such- Oh my gosh, the cutest laugh in the entire world. I love you, Rena. And the gang is ready to wrap it up and have dinner at Angel Mort. Before they leave, Satoko wants to walk around the village, since she likely doesn't know when she'll be back. And naturally, she probably also doesn't want to go back to St. Lucia. I mean, she got put in prison there. Why would she want to go back? Satoko roams around the village for a bit, seeing that her house has been torn down? What? Are you kidding me? This naturally depresses her a lot, as she realizes that there is no hope of the two coming back to town together since they have no place to stay. They will not be able to live the lives that they once had. After this, she ends up at the Furude Shrine, when a sound emits from inside of it. As any character would do in any horror, Satoko goes in to investigate it. What is incredibly worth noting here is that the shrine statue of Oyashirasama is repaired. Neither of the hands are broken. I know that we talked about this a little before, that the hands weren't broken previously, and maybe that that was just a change that Go had, but this takes place in Matsuri Bashi, so the hands should be broken. This brings into question if someone fixed it, or if this anime really does take place after Kai since this should still be broken. Another thing is that this statue is completely flipped around, as the left arm is raised in Go, while the right arm is raised in the original. I'm not entirely sure if this is an art inconsistency, but I think that it might be on purpose, but I'd like to go into that a little bit more in the next video. That's right. Stay tuned, folks. Satoko then taps the statue, and the statue cracks open. Hanyu's left horn falls out of the statue, and it is healed. In a moment that Satoko probably isn't thinking too much, she touches the horn and is transferred to the fragment world. This is when Feathering shows up? What? Oh, wait, no, no, wait. This isn't actually Feathering. Not yet, anyways. I actually believe that this is Hanyu, but the evil version of herself for a few reasons. The first is their outfits, which are strikingly very similar. The second is that they are both in the fragment world. The third being that she seems to be tied to Hanyu's horn, which is healed now. And the fourth being that she uses terminology and phrases that Hanyu would use, such as son of man. As I mentioned earlier in the video, Hanyu begged her daughter to kill her since she knew she would become evil again and she has been missing in the Higurashi timeline for five years now. It's extremely possible that in this gap of time, she returned to her evil form, and that this being Satoko named Iwa, probably said that wrong, is actually Hanyu. There are of course some slight connections to feathering, such as the green scarf, her belt, and her headpiece. Her walking stick is also the same, just with a little thingy on the top of it. And connections are furthered, but I won't talk about that in this video. Iwa is such an awkward name to use, so for this I'm going to use what my friend Beans refers to her as, which is Han Tu. Han Tu refers to Satoko as Veer, who is a character from Sikonia that is a Takano clone. Veer's full name is Veer Dressig, <laughs> I hope I said that right, which is a German play on words for the number 3 and 4, together being 34. She also calls her Mitsuyo, not to be confused with Takano's real name, Miyoko. Mitsuyo is another play on words in Kunyomi, which is Japanese sound reading. Mitsuyu meaning three, and Yo meaning four. 34, once again. And then she refers to her as anomalous spinal cord specimen LD3105. The spinal cord bit is another reference to Sikonia, and LD is abbreviation for Lambda Delta. 
3104 can be spaced out into 3, 10, and 5, which in Japanese can be read as San for 3, To for 10, and Go for 5. San, Ten, Go. This is wordplay once again, but this time it is for Santokum. We know this isn't a stretch because it's been used in the past to identify Santokum. However, the mention of spinal cord specimen is actually important, as it suggests that Sikonia took place before Higurashi since Han too is aware of it. I know in my last video that I said this would be the origin of Lamb, but I don't think that this is the case anymore. I think that rather Santoko is Lamb's new piece, or her new pawn, but I will go in depth about that in the next video. Santoko naturally doesn't know who she is. I mean, why would she? And Han 2 says that in millions of loops, Satoko has forgotten who she is. And Han 2 says that those that hold dominion above them are cold of heart, which could refer to the meta world in Umi Neko. It's also possible that this is just a direct meta callout for Ryu himself, for renewing the story and continuing it when everybody thought that it was over, making him seem cold of heart. She then goes to say that Santoko has come here because she has a wish, that is eaten away at her well-being. This is one of the meanings of the jail scene with Satoko, when she was begging to go back to the past to say no to Rika. Hantu then gives Satoko the power to live in loops. Also, really quickly, I think it's really weird that once again we have an antagonist that's blonde, with really big boobs, and wears green. Ryu, what are you trying to say here? Anyways, Hantu says that to begin looping, all Satoko has to do is die. Naturally, Satoko is like, Wait, what? <laughs> but Hantu goes on and says that her powers are stronger than the cat, referring to Rika as a cat. Kinda weird, I wondered why she's doing that. She then goes on to say that as long as Satoko is entertaining, that will refill her requirement of payment. After this, Satoko is brought back to 1983 on June 10th. Hantu gets included in the opening now, but she, uh, kinda looks like a character from the movie Truth or Dare, if you've seen that movie, and, uh, <laughs> oh man, why did they make her smile like this? What is really interesting is that Hantu told Satoko in the Matsuribashi world that she needed to die to begin looping. But Satoko is brought back to Kai's story anyways. This raises the question on whether Satoko is alive in Matsuribashi, and if that fragment will continue as normal since Satoko is technically alive in it. And it seems that there might be two instances of the two now. Satoko then starts monologuing about how the world she just came from must have all have been a bad dream. And there was no way Rika could ever treat her that way. No way, that'd be ridiculous. To everyone's surprise, not really. The events of Matsuribashi then happen again, where Takano is taken away with Tomotake, and that's when Sajiko realizes she is living it over again. After failing at convincing her to buy a practice booklet for St. Lucia, she does everything she can to keep Rika from studying. Her efforts don't really work too well, so she has a heart-to-heart -heart with Rika about how she doesn't want to go to that school or live through that experience. Even though Santoko says she would do anything for Rika, she doesn't want to go through with the entrance exam, and she knows she'll be outcast for her personality and her attitude. Rika then makes a promise, saying that she won't leave her alone, and that she promises she won't break her word. Two promises in one. The double promise is enough to convince Santoko to try St. Lucia again. But then we jump cut to St. Lucia, and we see that Rika is back in the parlor, drinking tea and having debates. Rika broke both of her promises. This is when we really, and I mean really, see Santoko's mental snap. She has a conversation with Rika in the main hall about how Rika broke her promise. And Rika says that she was the one to push away her help. Which I mean, technically is not wrong, but there were reasons Santoko didn't take her help. Rika then says that Santoko is the one that put herself below her, making it sound like Rika has a god complex, and Santoko then says the conversation isn't going how she wanted. She then hugs Rika, says let's begin very ominously, and then the chandelier smashes both of them. Ah! Okay, anyone that's been complaining about the lack of violence in Go after Neko Damashi and this, you best stop complaining. What is very important is that Satoko says she won't let Rika deceive her again, which is likely why every arc of Go has had deceiving in its title. This, like Satoko Washihen, could have a double meaning in it, which is that she won't let Rika or anyone deceive her, and she is also continually deceiving everyone around her. After this, Satoko begins a looping journey and continues to try and make Rika not go to St. Lucia. She gets her own Usoda moment after Rika makes a promise Santico knows she won't keep. And then she jumps in front of a van and gets isekai. Not actually, but like, dude, really? <laughs> Before getting smashed by the van, 
This is the first of many times we see Santico snap. They after this see a sunrise together, but once again, things fail. Santico says that she's acting like a proper Miko to Oyashira-sama, and then she cuts her neck and snaps again. And in probably the most brutal ways, in my opinion, after this, she tries to convince Rika to not go at school and then stabs herself in the neck with a pencil. I don't know why this was the worst to me. It, I, the idea of getting stabbed in the neck by a pencil at school, especially when you're surrounded by a bunch of kids. Ah. 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 Each time she does this, a fragment is created in the sea of fragments. Kantu is located. We see that seven fragments have been created, meaning that Satoko attempts to stop Rika from going to St. Lucia seven times at this point, and each time she has killed herself. They then get into a physical fight in the next fragment, where the two drown together. After this, we come to the fragment world, as the eighth fragment is created. Hantu is observing all these through fragments for her own entertainment. The price of Satoko's looping powers. Hantu tells Satoko about Rika looping for 100 years, and about how she struggled for so long to achieve one single victory. Satoko naturally does not understand, so Hantu sends her into a fragment. Oni Kakushihen, the very first fragment and point of the series, which also happens to be the first few minutes of Go's first episode. This means that the first few minutes of the first episode was likely foreshadowing all of this. Satsuko being there to observe this happening, and then go later starting after this point. Hantu and her then talk about how Rika nearly gave up many times throughout the years. She compares her endless efforts to what Satsuko is going through now, and she uses the infinite monkey theorem as an example for her point that Satsuko's wish will be granted eventually. Either Ryu really likes the infinite monkey theorem, or there is some other weird weird thing going on here. Satoko then states that she wants to go through all of Rika's fragments. That's right, all of them. All 100 years worth of them. And that she will not let Rika win. We then watch as Satoko relives Oni Kakushihan, Tataragori Shihan, Minagoro Shihan, and finally Matsuri Bashihan. Satoko descends into the Eerie Clinic where she finds her brother still alive. This to me was really interesting because I had always wondered what Satoko would do if she went and saw Satoshi. I'm not gonna lie, it was a little anticlimactic, but it was still heartbreaking as she bids her brother farewell and returns to the Sea of Fragments. I wish they had elaborated a little bit more on her finding out that after all this time, Satoshi was alive, he never ran away, and such like that, but you know, it is what it is. I'm going to mention this, although I don't really know its exact meaning, but Satoshi seems to have appeared from its bed in the scene where Santico turns around. This could be an art inconsistency, or this could have a little bit of some meaning to it. I will go ahead now though and say I think Satoshi waking up is just near impossible unless they go back in time and make him not kill their aunt. So this could be taken as Satsuko removing him from her life. This would also make sense since she says goodbye to him, meaning she lets go of him. And this would explain his total absence from Go. The player... Satoko removed him from the story. This would also make even more sense, as it seems a lot of characters don't really react in the same way that they did in the past revolving Satoshi. After looping for 100 years, going through all of Rika's fragments, Satoko ends her journey. She notes that despite any amount of time, mental damage doesn't change. In this, she is referring to Satoshi. They kind of messed up with the subtitling here, but if you watch it, she says Nini, meaning that she knows that Nini, her brother, is going to be mentally scarred forever. Hantu says that that's correct, and it's because of this that Rika almost gave up. She tossed the dice of fate for a millennia, and if it weren't for her friends in Hanyu, she would have given up. We do see this too, that she really wants to give up quite a few times in Kai, and in the probably the original series, but we don't get to see that as much. It's with this revelation that Satoko knows she will have to break Rika's will again, which is kind of weird that after going through 100 years, Instead of saying, wow, my friend went through a lot of stuff, you think to yourself, wow, I need to break their will and make sure they give up. Satoko asks if Hantu can give Rika the power to keep her memory through loops, and she notes that she could do it since her power is stronger than the one with the damaged horn. This is very interesting because Rika is given this power in Neko Damashi, but because of this interaction, this really foreshadows Hantu being Han Yu. Hantu then gives the power to Satoko to return to the same fragment as Rika, as long as she dies after Rika does. Satoko knows that Rika's weakness is not knowing the events right before her death, and she plans to take full advantage of that in a battle of wills. A contest of endurance, if you will. 
that her love for Rika is so great that she will ensure that Rika loses. Satoko originally was very fearful of the fragment world, but now she appears to have mastered the fragments and say with absolute certainty that Rika will lose. I'm not kidding here about her saying that with absolute certainty. Like I mentioned a little earlier about the subtitling issues, I've noticed that Go has a lot of these actually, and they're especially prevalent in this episode, but Satoko here says Zetai ni, which means certainty in Japanese. Her sentence in actuality is is Rika will certainly lose. I do find it incredibly ironic how Santico didn't want to study at St. Lucia, but spent 100 years studying Rika to make sure that she didn't go to St. Lucia. She's got some weird goals that are incredibly toxic. I'll go into my thoughts about all this once we talk about the last two episodes though. We then enter episode 23, where Santico is in a fragment at the game store. She tells Keichi she knows exactly what they're going to play, and Keichi says that she's acting prophetic like Rika. Satoko notes that this is exactly something Rika would do, however she plans to do much more interesting things. Satoko goes to play a game of memory, and this is where we see how far Satoko is willing to go to get the absolute results she desired. For Neko to Majihen, and even in this arc, Every death has been followed with the snap of a finger. Rika held out each arc until her very dying moment, presumably waiting for a miracle, and then she snapped. Satoko, on the other hand, snaps whenever she wants something to be absolutely accurate, which is implying she is killing herself. Her just snapping with no visuals of her dying is likely to suggest how desensitized she has become to death. It's very easy for someone to just snap their fingers, and after Satoko's rampant suicides last episode, with presumably more, this is likely implying that just like snapping, killing herself has become very easy for Satoko. Everyone naturally is shocked with how Satoko is apparently a god at memory, and Rika herself asks if she can tell her how she did it, to which Satoko says that this ability is well within Rika's power, nodding again to the fact that she is repeatedly killing herself. Han too says she's much more resourceful than the cat, and Satoko says that it's because she's willing to take actions to make sure her desired result will certainly happen. This is completely different to Rika, who will try over and over again and hope for a miracle. She then notes that she has an infinite amount of time to prepare, likely nodding to their battle of endurance. She says there is no way Rika will win. This entire time, Satoko has just been preparing. She then goes to name Hantu Iwa-san, which I don't think has any deeper meaning. I wouldn't try to look into it too much, but for now her real name is unknown to us. Satoko then inquires about how it's possible that non-loopers can remember events from past fragments. Hantu replies by saying her power is too strong for this world, and that each loop causes small changes to accumulate over time. This means that the more Satoko, or Rika, loop, the more the people around them will remember. Satoko asks if this means that the people who are closest to the looper are the most affected, and Hantu affirms that this is the case, since Rika is the only reason Satoko was able to come to this world in the first place. Satoko realizes that this might affect the last surviving member of her family, which is Tepe, but she brushes off the idea that is laughable. After this, ironically enough, we are brought to Tepe's apartment. Here, the police are investigating a weird smell which happens to be Tepe's dead body. One of the officers tells his partner that he should get a wife to keep himself from doing bad things to his body, implying Tepe had been a victim of substance abuse, which we can probably verified given the amount of bottles layered throughout his room. This led to him having a violent seizure, since a large consumption of drugs can lead to status epilepticus, a super seizure that can lead to brain damage or death. In this case, it did result in his death, as his body is revealed <laughs> and a jump scare. <laughs> is this anime or am I watching a shitty horror movie? Tepe then wakes up in another fragment, clearly remembering his lonely death. He then is beaten to a pulp as he dies again, and then wakes up in yet another fragment. He rushes to take some medicine and locks his door, obviously panicked from his strangely realistic dreams. He asks himself after his panic attack, what am I doing? Reflecting on himself for the first time probably ever. Tepe goes to play pachinko, which for those that don't know, pachinko is a form of gambling using metal balls that are very similar to arcade machines. It's very readily available in Japan, and it's not got as many legal constrictions as other forms of gambling does. Here at the pachinko place, he sees a father and daughter bonding. He goes to redeem his pachinko balls for prizes, where he again is met with the same father and daughter. The daughter is overjoyed with what her father gave her, one of these things being a wanya, which is almost like Ryu's mascot at this point. It's referenced through throughout many of his creations. Anyways, this leads to Tepe wanting to get a watch, but then questionably getting some Choco Donuts instead. He then goes to a park and sits on a bench to once again self-reflect, where he realizes he's been a really shitty guy, and this leads him to go back to Hinamizawa. 
We can already see a little bit how the looping has changed him, as he notes he used to hate the sound of cicadas, but now he really doesn't mind it. He then returns to his old house, which is locked, broken down in some places, and overgrown around the sides. Tepe sighs and is about to get on his moped to leave when he puts his helmet back down, saying there's nothing for him back at his apartment. He then decides to walk around town for a little bit, receiving some strange look from residents, and suddenly bumping into Sohtoko, almost giving the poor girl a panic attack. Upon seeing her, instead of being his usual loud and cursing self, he smiles at her and picks up the bag that she happened to drop. He even goes as far to give her the Choco Donuts he won from Pachinko, saying he ended up with these kitty snacks for some reason. Since we saw him picking out the goods, he almost chose a watch for himself as a reward for his Pachinko, but he instead chose the Choco Donuts with Sadako on his mind. Tepe decided not to get what he wanted, and opted instead to get something that Sadako might like, despite not knowing if he would even run into her, saying as he gives her the bag that his dog doctor tells him not to eat sweets and that he remembers her liking snacks. So on top of the watch thing and him getting this, he can't even have eaten them so he was obviously hoping to run into Satoko. Which is oddly considerate of him. Worried she won't like them though, he says that she should give them out to the kids at school and to make up for it he can drop by other pachinko prizes at her house later on. Satoko, just like I'm sure we all were on a first watch, is shocked, completely phased out of her mind. That's right. We're getting a motherfucking Tepe Redemption arc! In all honesty though, this is a bit of a risky move by Ryu. Redeeming an abuser in any medium has the potential of going wrong and upsetting the audiences, and is typically very controversial. Some audience members might see this as the creator trying to redeem somebody that has hurt a character that they very much relate to. A good example of this is Endeavor from My Hero Academia. I remember when his redemption first started that it was a really muddy topic for discussion. Personally, I'm for this. I could see it being very interesting point of contention in the story of Sotsu, and I'm curious to see where else this thread goes, but I'm not trying to invalidate how other people feel about this. For those that don't like it, I completely understand that. You have all the reason in the world to not like it. Also, I know that Ryu felt a lot of regret with how Tepe was handled in Minagora Hoshihen since his goal was to make no character feel like a total villain. Takano was an antagonist, but her point of view was still understandable. Tepe never got that treatment, and for Ryu to try and redeem him and go makes perfect sense to me. This is his chance to fix his one regret from the original series. Of course, still risky nonetheless. The next day, Satoko is riding through Okonomiya where she runs into a gang of delinquents. Tepe shows up in a scene that almost identically mirrors the scene when Satoshi came to save Mion in the original series. Down to his entrance, and to his defeat. After being beaten to a pulp for the second time this episode, Tepe is questioned at a police station about what happened. Oishi asks what we're all thinking when he says this is pretty out of character for him. After this, Satoko and Tepe go on a walk, where she asks him why he did that. Tepe tells her about his bad dreams he's been having lately, and Satoko likely realizes that this is due to fragment looping. He goes on to say that he's messed up his body, and he's realized if he doesn't change, he'll die alone. So he does realize the error in his ways, but it's kind of for selfish reasons. Tepe says that he has no right to be wanting a family after all the shit that he's done, acknowledging how terrible of a person he is. Despite all that, he's going to make up for all the pain and suffering he's caused, and that if Satoko would ever be willing to give him a second chance, he'd be happy to make dinner with her. Satoko naturally says that that is a bit much to ask, and Tepe says he knows it is, but he'll stop hanging around those bad guys and promises to never hit her again. He says that they don't have to do anything soon, but he'd at least like to be on speaking terms with her. He reaches out his hand to her, and she's about to shake it, but then remember his abuse and is scared away. Tepe apologizes, saying he should have known a handshake wouldn't be appropriate after what he's done. You could tell how defeated he is by his body language, and he realizes how he won't be able to instantly undo all of the suffering that he has caused, and there are some things that he probably will never be able to fully make up for. He then tells her to take care, and that he hopes that they can have another nice chat sometime as he walks away. Satoko here has full rights and is justified to not accept his apology after what she's been through with him. And this is why it's okay for both the viewers and Satoko to not accept this as an actual redemption. What is very interesting though is that this is almost a direct parallel to what Rika and Satoko's relationship has devolved into. Tepe was a bad guy and did bad things to her, and he forced Satoko to live with him and serve him whenever he came back to town. However, here he respects her wishes and doesn't force her to get involved with him. 
This is while Satoko is currently working towards forcing Rika to live with her, and supposed to be the message delivered to her to make her realize her selfish ways. It's very odd though how this message was delivered through Tepe of all characters. After this, Hantu and Satoko talk about what occurred. Hantu says that this was brought on by her power, and that the memories will get stronger and more widespread as the loops continue. Satoko says this is inconvenient, but she will use her uncle to his utmost potential. However, for the most part, she isn't concerned about him at all. To her, the biggest hindrance and concern is none other than Takano Mio. We then go into a fragment that seems like Matsuri Bashihan, but instead of what normally happens, we have Okanugi treating her pretty terribly, and Tomitake never comes to save her in the end. She ends up shooting herself in the head in this fragment, actually. She then wakes up in her office. That's right, guys. Takano 2 is remembering past fragments. It's just like how we theorized that everyone was remembering past events. We were correct. Takano receives a phone call from Nomura, codenamed Cuckoo and their operation, and the one funding research and the Eerie Clinic. Here we basically get recaps of Takano's origin story, which is that her goal was to make her father's theories about Hinami's Awa Syndrome come to fruition. For those of you that still haven't seen the original series, which if there are some of you that haven't, what are you doing? Go watch it. It's actually really good. Takano in the original was named Miyoko and lived with her mother and father. Her life changed forever when both her parents died in an accident. She was put into an orphanage that really resembled Satoko's time in St. Lucia's prison. Here she was abused and treated horribly, but managed to escape one night. She was getting chased however, but right before she's about to get captured, she begged to the heavens to live and become a god. And miraculously she managed to escape. Kinda weird parallels here aren't there? From there she called her father's professor and he took her in. The professor who she calls her grandfather, is the one that desperately tried to pioneer research into Hinamizawa syndrome, but his efforts resulted in countless failures, and he died before he ever got to see his dreams realized. However, they were fully realized by Takano in the original series, and resulted in her killing a lot of people. Anyways, Nomura says that Tomitake is on his way to Hinamizawa, and that succumbing to the syndrome is necessary for their plan to succeed. Takano seems relatively shaken up, and after this she goes to look through a photo album. She tells Iri that she hasn't looked through it since her grandfather died, but she felt compelled to do so today for some reason. She didn't want to open it until she had made her dream come true, but she decided to ignore that promise of hers. We know that she did this because she's remembering past fragments, and this is probably making her re-look on some of her actions or actions she wants to make. Since I imagine seeing yourself die, or in this case, shooting yourself, is probably a little mentally taxing. Once Eerie leaves the room, she decides to take a trip down memory lane and stumbles upon an envelope addressed to her. But before we can see what's in that envelope, Satoko is coming in for a checkup and notes that Rika is such a liar as Rika says she has no clue what's in Satoko's injections. Inside the clinic, she does blob readings where she clearly is referencing herself and Rika with how they were once far apart, but now are together and quote unquote happy. It's definitely her twisted way of seeing things. Takano then tells Satoko she's thinking of quitting, which is likely referring to her telling Tomitake about her sins. She's going to do this because the envelope was a message from her grandfather to her, saying that he would rather her quit her research and medicine so she could live a happy life instead. He doesn't want her to live out his ambitions for him. Which is very interesting. If this letter was here the entire time this series is going, then Takano's actions have all completely been in vain. She acknowledges to Satoko that she's begun to realize people are simply using her passion, to do horrible acts, with her as the pawn for their motives. She doesn't want to be involved with that. I do find it kind of odd though that she's sitting here venting to an 11 year old, but you know, do what you gotta do Takano, I respect it. After this, the festival takes place, and Satoko branches off to go and listen in on Tomitake and Takano. Takano tells him about her darker plans, and this results in the mountain dogs and everybody getting arrested. Hantu notes to herself that this is a world where Rika's tragedy never will happen. Satoko says that this isn't fair, and that she wishes for Rika to be trapped, but the birdcage opens up regardless to let her free. So despite everyone's memories growing stronger, and things seemingly fixing themselves for Rika's sake, Satoko will continue with her plan. As long as Rika wants to leave, Satoko will continue the cycle. This right here means that with this being a perfect world, none of the events in Go that happened should have happened. Satoko was behind the scene then for most of these things that happened in the series, in one form or another, or Han too had some kind of influence on what was happening. After this, we see Satoko enter the clinic to get H173, where she presumably kills herself a ton to get that damn suitcase. And this, my friends, is where the missing syringe in that suitcase from Nekodamashi is. Satoko acquires a single dose of Hinamizawa Syndrome, which means in each arc, she can only give that injection to one person. So in each arc, only one person truly has the syndrome. 
through her means anyways, they could totally develop it naturally. The possibility of Sachiko knocking out via traps or Satoshi's bat becomes very plausible. With the victims knocked out, she would inject them with the virus and that would begin their paranoia and descent into madness. With this, as Hantu states, Satoko has the power to strike tragedy wherever she wants and on whoever she wants. Satoko says she'll feel no guilt at all and in a world where Rika and her are together, there will be no tragedy. This is just shouting to the audience how far gone she is. Even going as far to say that whatever happens in other fragments never really happens as it isn't the fragment that holds her wish. The world and fragments she chooses is the only real world. Once Satoko decides to win, her victory is certain. As long as she holds her wish, that future is certain to happen. Then she goes very lesbian yandere by saying to wait for her, her beloved Rika. And this is where Go ends. So allow me to explain the timeline of Sachiko Washihen. The beginning starts off in Matsuri Bashihen and continues until Sachiko meets Han 2. Here Han 2 sends Sachiko back to the beginning of Matsuri Bashihen's fragment. Whether this fragment restarts as a whole, or rather if this is a new fragment that Hansu put Satoko in and the old Matsuri Bashi continues is left fairly unclear. Satoko then kills Rika by the chandelier, and after this she travels the Sea of Fragments for presumably hundreds of years. Could be longer for all that we know. While this is happening, Rika's looping is on temporary pause, and Satoko is just preparing and studying to guarantee her certain victory when the looping resumes for Rika. Once Satoko has finished completely preparing and obtains H173, this is where Go's Onodamashihen picks up, and when the Rika that died by Chandelier is brought back into her hell in Episode 2. This is where Go starts, and the Battle of Endurance truly begins. That is why she remembers St. Lucia, but not why she's come back or what has happened to her, as her condition of not knowing what led up to her death hours before still holds true. So Satoko Washi, as a whole, is the events leading up to go happening. This is why we find Satoko dead every arc with another person, or presumably after Rika. Knowing that her condition to die after Rika exists changes some things that have happened. For example, in Neko Domashi, I theorized that Satoko wasn't actually dead in Angel Mort when Keiichi was attacking. This is likely entirely true now, as Rika had not died yet in that fragment. So with that, I would like to clarify that all of the Rikas and all of Satoko's loops in this arc have not really been sentient, as the only one to hold Rika's true mind was the one killed by the chandelier. She does not remember any of these loops that Satoko went through at all. It was just Satoko going through them and no one else. The very first series of Higurashi had some prevalent themes in it, such as communication being a key to healthy relationships and friendships, and sin and atonement being another big prevalent theme inside of it. The events of Matsuri Bashi happened because the entire group began to communicate and work together. As well, in the last few arcs, they had atoned for their sins in past fragments. That's why the inclusion of Tepe realizing the error in his ways and Takano apologizing for her actions and other fragments fits pretty perfectly with Higurashi's themes. Go has essentially happened for one main reason, which is that Satoko and Rika were not communicating with each other. We saw that for 100 years, Rika suffered because she left things up to the dice of fate, and that is exactly what Satoko did at St. Lucia. She's letting life and other things drag her around. Due to Satoko's abuse as a child, especially one that was unresolved in the Matsuri Bashi fragment, she likely has a strong persecution complex. A persecution complex is where a person believes that they are the target of hostility or hatred from others for seemingly and irrational reasons. This complex is prevalent in Satoko Washi, as Satoko finds it incredibly hard to accept Rika's help because of the people surrounding her. She feels singled out and targeted as well as alone, and this is coupled with her abandonment issues from Satoshi leaving her. Rika was basically Satoko's rehabilitation, both with helping her fit in in Hinamizawa after the Dam War, and in getting her treated for Hinamizawa Syndrome. Rika was the person in Satoko's life that she always needed, helping her in many ways others did not. So without her in her life, Satoko's mental state clearly has spiraled out of control. This neglect Satoko feels ends up evolving later into jealousy and envy. She cannot stand how the other girls interact and have stolen Rika from her, and she she can't handle having Rika also abandon her like everybody else in her life. These events are what start the looping, and originally as attempts to persuade her out of her ways of Saint Lucia. However, Satoko realizes after many attempts and having promises broken, that she will never be able to convince Rika out of her ways. It is these failed attempts and multiple loops that turn jealousy and envy into obsession and fixation, which perfectly fit in with Higurashi's themes of sins and atonement. We've watched what little sanity Satoko had left being whittled away more and more, as well as some feelings of hers turn into sins. I know there is a war in the Higurashi community from this arc, either for Team Rika or Team Satoko, and frankly, I think they're both in the wrong. I understand why Rika would want to leave Hinamizawa. I mean, who wouldn't? She was thrown into a hole of confusion, miscommunications, 
and murdered over and over again. She did whatever she could to escape her hell and to survive, causing her to very clearly mature in ways the others around her had not. She almost gave up because she had suffered for so long and never seemed to get close to succeeding. But randomly, she was given a miracle and set free. After being trapped in a town for presumably a millennia, as well as being subjected to the murdering of you and your friends, it's natural to want to leave Hinami Zawa. She's completely jammed full of trauma and bad memories, and any person will want to leave something that makes their mental panic. Of course she seems fine on the surface, but we've seen in the past that Rika is very good at masking her true feelings. We've seen that on top of masking her feelings, she sometimes can be deceitful. She will lie or not tell the complete truth to others, or plant things in their head to achieve the results she desires. This ends up happening in Satoko Washi when she lies to Keishi in the games club and again when she breaks her promises with Satoko. I know she reached out a hand for help, but that still doesn't make it cool to break promises to your best friend and to leave them in the dust for a new life, especially one that has suffered through abuse, severe social isolation, and abandonment. Things that she all had seen on a first-hand account happened to Satoko. But I also understand why Satoko would want Rika to stay in her life for reasons I mentioned earlier. But she is going through fixing this bad blood in the worst ways possible. Satoko should be honest with her feelings and tell Rika the truth, instead of trapping her in Rika's worst nightmare. It's also incredibly selfish of her to see what Rika went through for those 100 years and to still want to go through with her birdcage plan. Despite both sides being understandable to a degree, every good story needs a villain, and it seems that that villain has unfortunately been solidified as Satoko, at least for the moment. As we all know, Sotsu is coming, and what Go has done for Sotsu is set up a game of cat and mouse. This game of cat and mouse, as well as other thoughts of mine like Han Yu and Han Tu, will be discussed in the next video. I know, I know, you want to continue the video, but I'd feel bad if this video was any longer. Like, I don't know what this video is going to look like when it's finished, but at the moment, the raw is probably going to be at least an hour. I don't really like making long videos because I feel like I'm wasting people's time. I don't know, it's some weird guilt complex thing. It's, it's, it's really silly. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for your patience. I'm really happy to be dishing out these videos to you finally. I can't even express how much I miss making these. However, there was no way I was going to give you these videos half-assed. I really hope the wait has been worth it, and I can't wait to see what you guys have to say about my thoughts. The discussions and the comment are my favorite part of this job. I just love talking and interacting with you guys. I started a QA and a in my last video, but I think I'm going to wait and do it in the next one, because this video is already just too long. Thank you as always to my patrons, Figar and Matt. You guys rock. Thank you so much for supporting me. Anyways, until next Sunday, everybody. I'll see you then. Come in.